Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. We believe God is actively working in your life, and we would love to hear about all that He is doing. If you feel led, please take a second to share your story with us at amen at freedomchurch.sc. If you would like to partner with our ministry financially, you can do so by going to freedomchurch.sc forward slash give and just select the giving option that works best for you. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. We started a brand new series of sermons last weekend here at Freedom Church, and our key verse for the whole series is coming out of the 11th chapter of the first book of Corinthians, which, if you don't know, the Bible, of course, is 62 books that are put together to make up what we call the Bible, but there are 62 individual books in the Bible, and 1 Corinthians is one of those that's in what we call the New Testament, which was all written after Jesus, and this book of Corinthians, we call it a book, but it was really a letter. It was a letter that Paul wrote to Pastor Paul, church planter Paul, we would come to know him as Apostle Paul. He writes this letter to the church in Corinth to give them instruction, to give them feedback, really to pastor them. It was much like a sermon because Paul had many churches that he was responsible for in the region and so he would send letters to these churches and then they would pass those letters around amongst all the churches and amongst all the people in the churches and it was a way that they could learn, a way that they could grow, a way that they could be fed by their pastor, Pastor Paul. And so he sends this letter inspired by the Holy Spirit and included in our Bible to the church at Corinth, and I believe it gives instructions that are good instructions for us as well as in 1 Corinthians, Paul, this normal guy, like this regular guy who has regular struggles and deals with things just like you and I deal with things and has sin in his life that he's dealing with just like you and I have sin in our life that we're dealing with, this regular guy named Paul, he just, he gives instruction to the people and he says to them, he says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. So even though he was a normal guy, even though he was struggle, had struggles just like we had, he knew that he had to say to someone else to follow him because he was echoing the words of Jesus who had said to follow him. And he was also echoing the words and the command of Jesus when Jesus had told us to go and make disciples. So Paul was living out this command to make disciples and he was treating it seriously in his life, saying to those around him and to churches that he led, say, hey, I'm going to live a life that is worthy of being followed so that you can follow me. And if you'll follow me, you'll be getting closer to Christ. And that is how we make disciples. That is how people grow. And so why don't we do that then? Let's just continue to follow Paul, to learn from Paul, to see how he handles sin in his life, to see how he handles conflict, to see how he handles pain in his life. Let's look at Paul in the book of Acts. In fact, the book of Acts is one of those 62 books that is included in the Bible. And something that is good to remember about the book of Acts is that it is a historical narrative. It's actually a historical narrative of the way the church was founded. And really even more than that, it's a historical narrative of the way that the Holy Spirit worked in and among the people. And the work and the the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit as the church rose up out of the fertile ground of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So it was the Holy Spirit spirit really that the book of Acts is about and it's told through the lens of the gospel writer Luke also writes the book of Acts and it's told through the lens of how he saw Paul living. And so it's important for us to remember that the Bible is not just a book that we read and oftentimes you'll hear people say well the Bible says this. The Bible doesn't really say anything. The Bible is the words of people who were inspired by God to tell their stories and their stories of their intersection with God. And so what the book of Acts is, is a lot of Paul's life. And if we're going to follow Paul as he follows Christ, it is good to read the book of Acts because we can see how Paul handled things. How Paul handled things like pain coming into his life. How Paul handled discouragement. How Paul handled disappointment in his life. And we can see that in the book of Acts. And so let's go to the book of Acts and read about Paul and his friend Silas. That's in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, starting with verse 16. 16, verse 16 of Acts. It says, One day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. So Paul and Silas and the other disciples were going down to the place of prayer when they encountered this little girl 
who is, a, is possessed by a demon, and that demon has given her, the spirit, demon spirit has given her the ability to tell fortunes. She's telling the future of people. And it tells us even in the next verse that she earned a lot of money for her masters by telling the fortunes. And so she had, this master had this little girl who had this kind of trick that she could do. And it was enabled by a demon spirit to be able to tell your future. And so they could tell futures and people would pay her to do this. And they were earning a lot of money doing it. And so it reminds me as I look at this verse and this little girl that success is not the only indicator of a life well lived. Like you can be successful at something and still not be living a life that God has called you to live. In fact, let me say it the reverse way of that. Life can be pretty hard and you can be going through some things that seem like failure and that can actually be an indication of your obedience. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, I believe that oftentimes what we have told people in the church is that life will be easier, life will be better, it will always be successful if you follow after Jesus, but there couldn't be anything further from the truth. In fact, Jesus said the opposite of that. Jesus said that there will be tribulation that will come your way, trials that will come your way, persecution that will come your way, that life will be harder. And so the success of this girl just reminds us that obedience often will look like turmoil in our life. That oftentimes when we obey God, life will get harder. But she was being very successful. And she followed Paul and the rest of us around shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. So picture this. This girl is following Paul and Silas around, and she's screaming out at them. She's going, hey, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they've come that you may be saved. And then they take a couple more steps, and she's like, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they've come that you might be saved. And then they take a few other steps, and she calls out again. She's just following them around doing that. Now, those, are, those in this house that can really kind of understand that the best are the mamas in the house. Because have you ever experienced this, mamas? Mama, 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 mama. Mama. And then you're just like, what? What do you want? And they're just following you around saying, mama. Over and over again, mama, okay, mama, mama. And you answer their questions and they still go, mama, mama, mama. In fact, in our house, we, we've got the problem that oftentimes there will be an question asked over and over and over and over again. Have you got any like that? They just, they just ask the same question over and over again. In fact, we've employed some legal tactics in our home with our children and what we've done is we've taught them the phrase that lawyers will often use, asked and answered. In other words, you've already asked this question, we've already answered it, and we're not going to answer it again. There's one in particular child in our home, and she's the smallest and I don't want to embarrass her by saying her name you know, because she's little and I want to talk about her, but it rhymes with Naya. And so she's, <clears throat> she's in her home. She likes to ask the same question, get an answer to it, like a full-on explanation for it, and then she will ask the same thing later. And, and, and so we will say, asked and answered. You don't get to do that. Not that that helps any. She still asked the same question over and over again. But this little girl was doing that to Paul and Silas as they're walking around. Mama, mama. They're just going around there and she's asking the same question. She's saying the same thing over and over and over again. This went on Day after day, and the scripture implies after day after day until Paul, remember Paul is a type A personality. He's a driven guy. He, he can't take much of this for very long. Paul got so exasperated. That's just a big word that means Paul got really ticked off is what that means. He got really mad, and then he turned and said to the demon within her. I love that phrase because he turns and says to the demon within her, how often is it that we'll take out on someone else what is really something that's happening within them? How often is it we will speak to our children, speak to our spouses, speak to our friends, and we think they're the enemy? We think the fact that they're treating us poorly, the fact that they are not encouraging us the way that they should, the fact that they're not obeying, we think it's all them. But the fact of the matter is, is there's some turmoil inside of them that's going on. And Paul recognized this, and it's something that we can follow him in, is that our enemy is not flesh and blood. He would later tell us in another letter that he wrote. Our enemy, he would tell us, is against principalities and darkness and the dark places of this world. We're not fighting a battle against a physical form. It's not our spouse that we're fighting against. It's not our 
children. It's not our friends. It's not our coworkers. It's, it's, it's a principality and a darkness that we can't comprehend. But Paul says they're there and they're fighting for, against us and we have to fight against them. We've got to realize that our battle is against something that is much larger than the person we're staring at and looking in the eye. Even sometimes when that is to look in the mirror and we fight a battle against ourselves, we've got to understand that there's something bigger going on. And Paul realizes that. He speaks to the demon within her. He realizes there's something within her. There's something inside of her. There's something that's warring against her. And I'm going to speak against that. And he says, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. So he calls something out of her. And in doing that, he's calling her up to what Jesus can have for her life. I love this, that Paul doesn't look at the situation and get critical. Paul doesn't look at the situation and complain. Paul doesn't look at the situation and think there's no way this could ever change. Paul looks at the situation and says, what this situation needs is Jesus. And I'm going to speak Jesus over her. I'm going to call something out of her. I'm going to call her up to something higher. And I'm going to change her life. And he looks right at this demon spirit and calls something out of her and instantly it left her. And listen to verse 19. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. Like, like this was the business plan for this man. And all of a sudden his money train has come off the tracks. All of a sudden he's got no business plan. All of a sudden he's got nothing to do. He has lost his one trick wonder and he has lost this little girl who could go out and tell people's futures and all of a sudden she can't do that anymore. So the masters grab Paul and Silas and they drag them before the authorities at the marketplace because they're angry. So they drag them over to the authorities and they've got to do something about this. They've just lost this income. What are they going to do about what Paul and Silas have done? And they go over, and this is what they say to the authorities. I love this. So, so they go over. Remember, this just happened. This one little girl's following them around. There's no indication that anything else has gone on. There's no indication that anything else is happening. But this one little girl's following around. Finally, Paul looks and goes, hey, I'm going to do you a favor. You, get out of her. Now you stop following me around. You go bun, bun your way. He frees her from the spirit. And then look what this man, the master, says them. The master takes him to the authorities and says, the whole city is in an uproar. Because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. Here's what I want to ask about verse 20. And sometimes you need to ask about things that are going on in your life. Is it now? Is the whole city in an uproar? Like, is it now? Is everybody in our workplace upset about this? Or is this just you, Mrs. Go Around and Get a Petition Signed all the time? <laughs> You've got one in your office too, right? Is everybody saying something? Every time I hear that phrase, everybody thinks, or they are saying, like anytime someone comes to me as a leader and says, they are saying such and such and such and such, I go, who is they? I want to see a list and put it all on a piece of paper, put every single name down that you mean is they. What I usually find is it's one or two people, usually maybe just one, who have decided to bring they along for them. They is usually a solo crowd. They believe this. Whenever someone comes, everybody's in the family is upset with you everybody is. You need to tell them, give me names and numbers because I'm going to call them and ask them who's upset. I need to hear from them that they're upset. Don't let somebody come and stir you up to a mob that's going to happen in your brain or in your life. They can stir families up. They can stir businesses up. They can stir job places up. They can stir little league teams up. All that stuff. Well, they, they think that they're coaching wrong. Who's they? Who thinks I'm coaching wrong? Tell them to come and talk to me about it. That's the best thing you can do is call they to come to your place. Tell them, come on over. Come and see me. Because Hebrew says that we are supposed to stir one another up, but we're supposed to stir one another up to good things and good deeds and praise and worship. And there are people in your life that are addicted to drama. They, they can't watch enough drama on TV at night. they got to create their, create their own in their life. And they are addicted to stirring things up. And they'll stir up a mob. Now, you, they'll come and tell you everybody's upset. And before long, they'll make you do stuff that gets everybody upset. Has one of your kids ever done that? They will come to you and make things such a big idea that all of a sudden you were going through the house and you were upset with everybody. Come to find out it was just their problem and they were trying to bring their brothers and sisters into it. That's what a big sister does good. A big sister brings their brothers and sisters into the other problem with them. And that's what people will do. They will stir up drama in their life. And so they go, they say that the everybody's crazy. They've gone crazy. And then, and then looking, this is what you can always tell. you you got to look at whoever's trying to stir things up You've got to see what their motive is. What is their motive? 
And the motive here is this guy's just lost a lot of money. You've got to see what they're motivated, and you've got to see what their character is. And so all of a sudden, this, this master comes, and he plays the morality police. Now, this is a guy who has had a young slave girl. Let's just stop there. He's had a young slave girl. He's had a young slave girl that he found out has a gifting from a demon spirit, and he's been making money off of her. And now he's going to be the moral police. Have you ever had that? Somebody that has no morality whatsoever, but all of a sudden when you fail because you call yourself a Christian, they are quick to point out Leviticus to you. They know Leviticus. They don't know anything else, but they know some stuff out of Leviticus. They, they know how to quote that. Look at verse 21. He says, they are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. So all of a sudden he is all up in a stir. And then look at 22. A mob quickly formed. Well, of course it did. He stirred the mob up. And a mob forms against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. It escalates fast. It goes from helping somebody to being hurt in just a moment. And this is what happens. And then in verse 23, they were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So they give him a job. They say, look here, do not let these guys escape. They're, they've stirred up a mob out here. Everybody's going crazy. Put these guys in. Do not let them escape. So the jailer goes and puts them into the pit of misery. Dilly dilly. So that's what, no, it doesn't say that. It actually says, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamp their feet in the stocks. The inner dungeon. So the dungeon wasn't good enough. They go and take them into the inner dungeon, inside the dungeon. And they lock them in there and they put clamps on their feet. And I, this had me thinking. I wonder how many of us, we're not really physically in a dungeon, but we're in an inner dungeon. There's some stuff going on inside of us, and we are prisoners to the pain. We are held captive to the to, to circumstances in our lives. We are held captive to the fact that we are bitter about something that's going on. We haven't let somebody go by forgiving them. We are in an inner dungeon. You may, may not be under shackles right now, and you may not be in a dungeon, but inside of you there's a dungeon that is there, and it's keeping you hostage. It's hostage to your hostility. It's keeping you hostage to the fact that you won't let the healing come into your life. It is keeping you hostage to the fact that you won't forgive them and is keeping you hostage to the hurt that they brought to you and you are walking around allowing yourself to be in a dungeon of someone else's making inside of you. They've got free rent right inside of you because every single day they are living inside of you. It is a dungeon that is an inner dungeon in your mind. It is a dungeon that is your thinking that is causing you to, to do the things that you do. It is your inner dungeon that you are held captive to and you haven't allowed God to work in that and these guys are put into this inner dungeon and they have the potential right now to be held captive to their thoughts, to be held captive to their day. And the jailer put them in the stocks. And my sermon title for the day is, what do you do when you have a bad day? Would you agree that Paul and Silas have, are having a bad day? That like they started out like they're just walking around going to preach some gospel and this girl's getting on their nerves and all of a sudden because she's getting on their nerves, they try to do something good for her and she's set free and the next thing you know, they are beaten, stripped naked in the inner dungeon, locked up. That's a bad day. Some of you have had some bad days. You have never had a day like that. That's a bad day that they are having. And Paul has told us to follow him as he follows Christ. So let's follow him into his bad day and let's ask the question, what do you do, Paul? Like, what do you do when you have a bad day? Look at verse 25. First thing we've got to see is around midnight. I love that phrase because what does midnight mean? Midnight means the clocks have turned over and it's a new day. Midnight means today has now become yesterday. Midnight means that whatever was going on in my day today is no longer a part of my day because I got a brand new day. Midnight means that things are changing, new things are coming, new hope is coming, new mercy is coming, new glory is coming. Midnight means I get to start over. Midnight means I may have lost my everlasting mind yesterday, but I got it back this morning because midnight Midnight has started. Midnight means they may have let me down in that relationship, but a new relationship can come. Midnight may mean I went to bed mad at my wife, but I can wake up this morning and she's pretty like she was yesterday because it's a new day. Midnight means I may not even have been attracted to him yesterday, but today he's my husband and I'm going to start over because a new day has come. It tells us in Lamentations, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. Remember, we don't need to learn a whole bunch of stuff. We need to remember some things. We need to remember 
remember what God did. It says, I remember this. I remember the faithful love of the Lord never ends. He says, mercies never cease. And that his great is his faithfulness. His mercies, listen to this, begin afresh every single morning at the strike of midnight. You got a brand new bucket of mercy to carry around. You may have spent it all yesterday being a terrible person, but you get some new mercies today. You may have been the worst parent that has ever lived on the face of the earth yesterday, but today you can be parent of the year because it is a new day. You may have failed, you may have fallen, but guess what? At midnight, you get to get up. I was getting more excited than y'all were. Y'all made me mad. Around midnight. I need midnight. I need midnight to come every now and then. I need midnight. I'm at the end of a day sometimes, and I need a new day to roll over. I need a new one. I need a start over. And Paul says, and the scripture says, at around midnight. Around midnight. Get, look at this. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, there is something about this, their posture that we need to see that I believe is embedded in this verse. And it's, it's, it's embedded in there and it's easy for us to miss. Sometimes the best things in Scripture are easy for us to miss because we, we walk right past them not realizing the implications that it can have in our very lives. And right in this verse there is, there is an implication. There's something that we're supposed to just walk past and assume. There's something that we're not supposed to notice. And it's the posture that Paul, Paul and Silas had going into midnight. We see midnight and we think that that's the starting line for something fresh and something new. But it's what Paul and Silas were doing before midnight that matters. It's, it's what they were doing in the midst of their bad day. They were having a pretty awful day and right in the midst of their bad day, they took a posture that I don't think many of us take very often. And the posture that they took is that they were praying and they were singing. They were at midnight already praying and singing. See, what we see in Paul and Silas and they're teaching us right here, we're following them, remember, is that in the midst of their bad day, they were not tempted to develop a bad heart. And that is what we do, isn't it? Because there is a difference. Some of you have had some bad days. But there's a difference between a bad day and a bad heart. Remember Peter. Peter, Jesus told him, he said, you will betray me. Before the rooster crows, you will betray me. You will say you don't even know who I am. You will act like you've never seen me before. You will speak as if I am not a, you won't be there for me. You won't have my back. Before it ha a rooster crows, you'll do this. And sure enough, Peter betrayed Jesus. Peter had a really bad day. Judas, he said to Judas, he said, Judas, you're going to, betray me. He said, the one who kisses me is going to be the one who gives me up to the authorities. And Judas, for just a little bit of coin, goes and he gives Jesus up to the authorities. And Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter betrayed Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter had a bad day. Judas had a bad heart. Because Judas, I mean, Peter would have a comeback. Peter, Peter would get confronted by Jesus just a few days later, and, and, and he would say, hey, you, I am the rock, and you're the little rock, and I'm going to build my church upon you. You're steady. He spoke life over him. He said, you're not the guy who had a bad day. You're the guy who has a good heart. You're the guy who seeks after me, goes after me. And there is a difference between having a bad day and a bad heart. In fact, what we can see is that oftentimes a bad heart starts with a bad day. A bad day starts, can I preach this just a little bit? Can I, can I, if you'd have said no, I'm still going to do it. But I just, a bad heart starts with a bad day. A bad day starts with a bad hour. A bad hour starts with a bad moment. And it's in those moments that we have to decide. The scripture says that God puts before us to death or life. He says there's death, there's life. You choose which one, death or life. And he says choose this day life. And every single moment we have an opportunity to decide, will this be a bad moment that I take captive and I put under the lordship of Jesus Christ? Or will this be a bad moment that turns into a bad day? And then for some of you it's turned into a bad cycle and a bad season and a bad month. And, and it's turned into a bad life. And now you walk around and 
and you're complaining and you're just always critical and you're always having a bad day. You haven't had a bad, a good day at work in years. You don't even like your job anymore. You don't like your spouse anymore. You don't like your children anymore. You don't like anybody anymore. And you just walk around complaining and you think you've had a bad life. See, here's the thing. You didn't really have a bad day. Like, you don't have a bad day. Nobody's ever had a bad 24 hours. You had a bad moment, but you decided to let that moment define your destiny rather than saying, no, I'm not going to let that be my destiny. I'm not going to let somebody having an attitude with me be my destiny. I'm not going to let the inner turmoil that is within me win. I'm not going to let you put something on me that's not mine. A lot of you are walking around here and you've got the inner, you're in the inner dungeon because you've let somebody else bring their pain into your life. You've let somebody else bring their shame into your life. You've let somebody else bring their disappointment into your life. Don't let somebody else's disappointment disappoint you and God. You go and say, I'm not having a bad moment. I'm going to captive this moment and God is better than my word moment. On, every, on my worst day, he's still good. God on my worst day is still God. I'm not letting that rock me. I'm not letting that report from the doctor rock me. I'm not letting that, that death in my family rock me. I, because here's what, here's what Jesus is trying to teach us. I think what he's trying to teach us what, through Paul right here, what the Holy Spirit is trying to mold in us is to realize that we get upset by the moment. We get upset by the, the diagnosis that we get on their phone. We get upset by the, the ending of the relationship. We get upset by these things and they can ruin our lives. And what Paul is trying to teach us and what the Holy Spirit is trying to cultivate in us is that we would be able to see that the reason it should not rock us the way it does, the reason that God is still good even in those moments is because this is not all there is. This is just a blip on the screen and a moment on the blip on the screen is just a blip on the blip of the screen. It is nothing. God is saying, look, there's so much more. And I left you here for one reason. And that is to walk with my presence into other people's lives and to say, follow me as I follow Christ. So if you can't accept a bad moment and not have a bad day, what good are you doing to let them follow you? I need somebody who's going to be strong, who's going to walk with a strut to their life. I need somebody who can handle some stuff. What if, what if yesterday's weakness and struggle was just the price that you had to pay to get the wisdom that you needed to have the strength to be able to lift somebody up. What if yes, what you're walking through right now that you're calling a bad day is not a bad day at all. It's training camp. What if what you're walking through right now is not a bad day. It's actually the day that God appointed for you because he needed you to build some spiritual muscles because he's got some stuff he wants you to. There's a blessing that he wants to give to you that you don't have the strength to carry right now. And he just wants to say, look, I want to develop you into something. If you can't even handle a boss being a little bit snippy to you, how are you going to handle those principalities of darkness that want to come against you? And some of you go, I don't have any of that stuff. i got a great life. Everything's wonderful. Everything's blessing in my life. Everything's perfect in my life. Can I tell you that Satan's probably not against you if you're already on his team? I mean, if you're not doing anything to make a difference in the world, you probably got an easy life. you probably got an easy like, like Here's what Jesus said about our lives. He said, if you obey me, you're going to have trouble. And you know what he said? He said, there's a big, huge, open, super highway. You can take that. It'll be much easier. But if you want to obey me, you're going to have to scooch in right between this little tiny place right here. And you're going to get in there, and it's going to be uncomfortable, and it's going to be painful sometimes. And I'm going to have to teach you some things because to get to the place where I want you to be more like me and be the direct image bearer of who I am, you're going to have to get some stuff out of you. Our bad days are often just sandpaper trying to get the stuff off of us that doesn't need to be on us. And it's just, just trying to develop us. Trying to develop us. And so they're there. And they're preaching this through their lives. Don't let a bad moment ruin your day. And then it says, and the other prisoners were listening. Last week we said that you get a chance to look at people and tell them, follow me. Just follow, follow me as I follow Christ. Do you know that I really overstated that in some ways? Because you really don't get an opportunity to say no. Whether you like it or not, they're always listening. You know that song, I always feel like somebody's. They are. It was true. It wasn't, the, it wasn't just a paranoid person who wrote that song. They really are. They're always watching you. They're all, they're always, your kids are always watching you. There's people in your life that are they're waiting. They're, they're waiting to see, is this real? Like they keep talking about this. Jesus, is it real? 
So like when they get mad, do they do something different? Or are they just like me? Because if they're just like me, then what difference is it making? And all of a sudden, these guys are in chains, in bondage, in a bad day. And they're singing and it says, and the prisoners were listening. Someone is always listening. Someone is always following. It's just the real question is where are you leading them? You're taking people somewhere. The, the question that we have to have is where are we taking them? Suddenly, though, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. He had one job, like one job. His job was to keep these guys from escaping, and he put them in the inner jungle, a dungeon. He put them in there. He, he put the ropes around them. He tied them up. He locked them up, everything, and now they're gone. So he's like, I'm going to kill myself because they're going to kill me anyway. And he's so distraught. And all of a sudden, but Paul shouted to him, stop. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights. Because sometimes you need some light to come into your life, into the darkness, just to make sure it's real. Every now and then you, just, you need to make sure what you're hearing from God is real. God will give you what you need in the time that you need it. He'll give you this, the vision to see what you need to see. He'll turn the lights on on some things where you can see some things. And he brings in the lights and he ran to the dungeon and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked... Sirs, what must I do to be saved? we, we got to see this. The way that we act during our days of defeat, during our bad days, will create a character in us that will also allow us to handle humbly our days of success. And when we do that in front of the world, they will come to us and go, I need some of what you've got. I need something. There's something different about you. When you fail and you do fail, you're real. When you fail, you're authentic about it and you, you handle it with just unbelievable dignity. You, you handle it well. You always say you're sorry. When you lose your temper, you always come back and say something that, that's, that's different. This is different about you. And then when you're successful, you don't rub it in our faces. You, you don't walk around acting like you're better than us. You just say it's all for him. It's all his glory. It's all his glory. And when I, when I fail and I'm able to get up, it's his glory. He's the one who picks me up. When I'm up, it's only because he picks me up and he keeps me standing up. And you just, you just have something different about you. And they replied to him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. The ripple effect here. There is a ripple effect. When you throw out anger, there's a ripple effect. Some of you are still living in the wake of the ripple effect of a father who was throwed out, threw out anger all the time. And you carry that around with you because you think that's the way you're supposed to act when you get angry. You think that when you're mad, you're supposed to hit something or somebody. And so you've started to do that as well. And it's a ripple effect. It came from your father. And you had the chance right now to go, no, I'm throwing out something different. I'm throwing out peace. And there's going to be a ripple effect in my life of peace. I'm throwing out hope. I, I, maybe you grew up in a home of a, just someone who was always skeptical of everything, someone who was always a critic and a cynic, and someone who always had the negative to say about something. And now you find yourself, and you might would even say, well, I sound just like my mother. I'm always critical. I'm always putting down the kids. I'm always, it's a ripple effect. The ripple effect will get to you, but you have a chance to make a new ripple effect, and you throw out life, and I'm going to speak life over my kids, and I'm going to speak life over my situation, and I'm going to speak life over my friends, and I'm going to assume the best about people, even when they're at their worst. I'm always going to assume the best about people, and it can shut down cynicism in your life when you start to have that change in you. And there's a ripple effect that happens because this whole household is affected. Do, do you know that there are people that are depending on you that you don't even know? There are people that are depending on you because someone's following you that they're following. There are people that are depending on you to make a difference in their life. That's why God left you here. So you didn't get left here just to kind of exist. You got left here with a purpose. And there's a purpose that God has for you. And he says there's a ripple that's happening. Even at that hour, let's look at this. This is, so, this is such a great picture of how it works. Even, that hour, even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. That he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. I love this. Because he cared for them and washed their wounds. Why? Because it's what you reap is what you sow. Paul had cared for him. Paul, Paul had been there in his moment of need. When, when he was getting ready to take his life, Paul said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, you don't need to do that. 
I didn't treat you that way. I know, I know I'm not going to do you like that. I'll be set free when I'm set free because I'm already set free. I don't have to worry about the bo- this bondage just right here. I don't have to worry about that. He says, I'm not, I'm not held captive to, to having to be, get back at you because you got at me. So Paul went, did the thing. He did the gift of going first. And there's some of you in here, you're waiting for your spouse to go first. Why don't you give them the gift of going first and you just forgive them. There's some of you in here who are waiting for your, for your children to obey before you treat them like children who obey. Why don't you treat them like children who obey, love them, give, care for them because it will come back to you. The very thing that Paul needed to be cared for. Listen, he had been beaten up, stripped naked and was bleeding and in pain. And in that moment he was caring for someone else. The very care that he needed came because of the effect of it coming back to him. It was what he sent out that came back. And I just got to ask all of us, what are we sending out? If, if you're getting criticism back all the time, how, how often are you critical? If you get bitterness back a lot of times, how often are you bitter? If you're getting something, you're not getting anything back at all, what are you giving? What are you putting out there? Well, Paul does that. He gets exactly what he needs. He brought them into the house and he set a meal before them. I love, I love this too. Then everyone in their household was immediately baptized. It's a spontaneous baptism, by the way. Paul was like, look, we got some shorts. We got T-shirts. We got the pool ready for you. If you need to get your hair did, we got that for you too. We got everything for you. And then, then, then they feed him. The, 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 the master or the um, jailer feeds Paul and Silas. The very one who had kept them captive is now the one that is providing for their nourishment and their sustenance. The very one who had taken life from them is now giving them life. All in an instant. Why? Because Jesus changed his life. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. Like, you got to let them go. Those guys, when they come, they got into prison, the whole prison shook and the doors flew open. We got to get those guys out of Dodge. We got to get them out of town. And so the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said to you, and Silas are free to leave, go in peace. Can I just show you this? Paul and Silas could have made their own way. They had a chance to take something before it was given to them. They had a chance to take their freedom before it was given. They had a chance to go out and get ahead of God. And oftentimes what we'll do is we'll get ahead of God. They didn't get ahead. They sat and they waited on God. And look, God provided them freedom in the best way possible, that they were set completely free. They weren't on the run. They weren't escaping from anything. They walked out of there as free people. They walked out of there as going, I don't have to walk out of here looking like a criminal. I can walk through this town just like I want to because there's nothing holding me back. I've got freedom because they waited on God. But I got one idea that I want to show us, one idea that I want you to get today. As we follow Paul, what we learn from him, that that Paul is giving us this example, that we praise through the pain. See, our posture is, is that we often retreat away. We run away during the pain. Pain comes in and we think, well, God must not be real because he wouldn't allow pain in my life. But instead we run to God and say, you're the only one who can heal me of this pain. We oftentimes run away from church because we go, I've sinned and I've got sin in my life so I can't get in front of people because I'm embarrassed. I have shame. And perfect love casts away all fear. There's no fear. There's no shame. We come into his presence. We, we come and we praise through the pain. And so our normal posture is, is bitterness or fear or retreat or anger or victimization. And what Paul is showing us is, no, 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 you, you praise through the pain. When you're going through, that's when you go after God the most. When you're going through a crisis, that's when you've got to get in his presence. When you need a new word, that's when you've got to get to where you're close to him so you can hear from him. He says you've got to get close. I love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne. Come, bo- come running to God. Boldly. Walk in there like you own the place because you do. You're a son and the daughter of the king. And so you walk in boldly to the throne of our gracious God. He is so gracious. Some of you grew up thinking that God is mad at you and angry at you and doesn't like you and just wishes that he could punish you and can't wait to punish you. Can I just tell you that someone lied to you? He is gracious. He is a gracious God who loves you so much in spite of all of your mistakes, in spite of all of your failures, in spite of everything that you're going through right now. He loves you. He is gracious and and our gracious God. There we will receive what mercy we get, why do we go to him and praise during the pain? Because he gives us mercy. We'll find grace to help us when, when we need it most. 
when we need it most is when we run towards God. So I found myself in a place recently where it was a little discouraged. The thing, things had not gone the way that I thought they were going to go. Um, and it was mainly a control thing. Like I like to control situations. I like to have a plan. And it hadn't gone the way I thought it should have gone. And it was, it was a pretty big deal and kind of walking through it. And I had the temptation to take the posture of bitterness. Look at what they've done to me. Had the posture, uh, temptation to take the posture of anger. Well, well, wait, I'll just show them. Had the temptation to take the posture of retreat and, you know, going into the, the sadness. Some of you are just sad. Like you just, you've been sad for a long time and you don't even remember what made you sad anymore. You just know something broke your heart and you haven't been able to get past it. It's the posture you're in. It's sadness and you just can't get past it. It's pain. It's just ever present there for you. And I had the temptation to retreat right into that. But I was reminded of a sermon. It was a sermon that I preached, so I even preached to myself sometimes. I was reminded of the sermon. I went back and I watched it. And in the sermon, I remember I remembered talking about a similar incident where I had gone through a struggle and I had kind of processed through some stuff. And, and I used that phrase that I was just praising through the pain. And, and I remembered there was this one song that's it's really important to me. I actually keep it on the desktop of my Mac and I can play it anytime I want to and I need to and I play it all the time and it always speaks to me and the, the lyrics of this song go like this it says even when the fight seems lost can I just encourage you to keep fighting I know that it seems lost I know that it seems like he'll never change I know that it seems like there's no possible way that they'll ever come back around. I know that it seems like there's no possible way that you could ever have a friend again. But even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. Even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing, it doesn't make sense to sing in the inner dungeon. It doesn't make sense to sing when you're tied up. And I can just imagine that Paul was like, hey, Silas, what if we started singing some songs about all God has done? Doesn't make any sense, I know. But I know we got chains around our feet. But what if we started singing about how chains must fall and fear must bow? I know we're fearful right now because we don't know what they're going to do to us. But they can't do anything to us. It doesn't slip through the hand of God. So what if we just started singing to God right now? What if we just started singing when it doesn't make sense? What if we started praising him for what he's going to do even though we don't know what it's going to be like? What if we just started singing to God even in the midst of our doubts? What if we just sang? I know it doesn't make any sense to sing sing right now Silas but what if we just sing like he's already delivered us and they started to sing because even when it makes no sense to sing they says louder louder I think about David in the Old Testament David was so excited about what God was doing, he stripped naked and ran through the streets singing about God I don't advise that in 2018 it's not wise but he strips, he didn't know what, he couldn't think of anything more. He just strips naked and starts running through the streets. He's just praising God. And his daughters and his family are like, Dad, what are you doing? You're embarrassing us. Can you imagine being David's dad, our daughter at that moment? What are you doing? You're embarrassing us. He goes, oh, oh, you think I'm being undignified now? He said, you just, I can be much more undignified than this. Like you don't even, he basically is the 2018 equivalent of going, oh, you think I embarrassed you at the high school game last night. Oh, you just wait. You wait to the next one. You don't even know what's going on. He's like, I can be much more undignified than this because I don't even know how to express what I need to express to God. It, louder, even when it makes no sense to sing, louder than I'll sing your praise. Even louder when I'm hurting. Even louder when I'm doubtful. Even louder when I don't know what's coming next. Even louder when I don't even believe the words I'm singing, I'll sing them louder. Because maybe if I'll speak to myself and maybe if I'll put some new thoughts in my brain, it'll come out. And so I'll keep singing. I'll keep striving. I'll keep working. I'll keep praying. When you're tempted to worry, praise. Worship. When you're tempted to be anxious, praise, worship. Because when the praises go up, the power comes down. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. You don't even know what God wants to bring for you. If you'll praise Him, 
when it makes no sense. God, would you allow us, even in this moment, to hear so clearly from you that we are ready to praise you, that we are ready to worship you in this moment of our pain. God, we thank you for the fact that you still have a purpose that far outweighs our pain. That God, in our moment of hurt, that you've already got a healing planned. And so God, it is this moment that we've waited for where we can come into your presence and you can be simply God. And so help us to meet with you now. In Jesus' name, amen.